Amen. Well, I'm so thankful to have Megaly home to help us with the music. Thank you very much, Meg. <laughs> we spent some time this afternoon practicing. It'll get better as we go along, the Lord willing. So uh, anyway, please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 18 tonight, Acts chapter 18, looking at verses 18 through 23. The message is entitled, Paul Gets a Crew Cut. Paul Gets a Crew Cut. Now, you know that uh, as we were in Acts the last time, that was actually three weeks ago, because May 24th was Jim Buer and uh, giving us a missionary message. Uh, and then on the 31st, that was the fifth Sunday special, we had the DVD, The Search for the Lost Shipwreck of Paul. And uh, the last time that we actually were here in Acts chapter 18 was on May 17th, which is Troublemakers Will Be Beaten. And that was verses 14 through 17. So I'm going to start reading back there in verse 14 so that we can get our minds back on track as to what's actually happening here in this passage. So Acts chapter 18, looking at verse 14. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence unto Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. And that's our key verse for tonight. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word and for its power. And as we see the activities of the apostles in the New Testament, looking back in the scriptures to see why they did the things that they did. Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the text that is immediately preceding our passage tonight, which we looked at all the way back on May 17th, Gallio clearly understood that the difference between criminal law and religious activity. Unfortunately, some of our courts today don't understand that, and we, we did a great deal of discussion about what was actually happening uh, with the cases going up before the Supreme Court of the United States now and some of the lower cases in the courts of appeals and in the various district courts across the country and even in some cases in the state courts. And so here we have a Roman proconsul named Gallio, and we talked about who he was, a very important man in history and uh, a man related to the man who trained Seneca, uh, the great Roman senator. And so very key issues were being discussed here in the presence of this man who had been trained very, very well. He understood the difference between criminal law and religious activity. And he followed a procedure, which we discussed in some detail, that guaranteed that the Jews would never again bring the same kind of trumped up charges and waste his time. Judges don't like to have their time wasted. Judges try to clear their dockets as quickly as they possibly can. And so Gallio used a Roman prerogative that was available to Roman judges, uh, which cleared the courts of phony lawsuits and rigged trials. That is, he could simply say, there is no case here, and then the defendants could beat up the plaintiffs. And that's what took place here in this case. It says, all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. We don't know for sure whether that's a reference to the Greeks in general who simply were present at the court that day, or whether it was the Greek converts. Remember, we're in Corinth when this is going on. The Greek converts that Paul had made while he was preaching there for 18 months. The Corinthian church was a pretty rough church, and we discussed the type of people that were in that church. As you look at 1 Corinthians, there's a whole list of different kinds of people that got converted under Paul's ministry there at Corinth, and some of them were pretty tough characters. So it might have actually been these brand new Christians who beat up Sosthenes. We don't know for sure, and they would have been pretty upset in any case that 
the hypocritical Jews had dragged Paul in on trumped-up charges. But uh, Gallio, it says he didn't care what they did. The defendants exacted justice against the head plaintiff, who in this case happened to be Sosthenes. Then we looked at Sosthenes. You remember who Sosthenes was? He was the successor to Crispus. Remember, Paul was meeting in the house right next to the synagogue. That's where the church settled down. And there was just one wall between the two of them. So there were people there in the synagogue who were hearing the Apostle Paul preached. And as he preached, some of them got converted, which is what sort of upset the Jews who were worshiping next door. One of those who had gotten converted was Crispus. And obviously, when he got converted, he was removed from being the chief ruler of the synagogue, which was right next door. But God, in his wisdom, and I think somewhat to a humorous extent, put in another man who would also get saved. Still trying to reach the Jews at the synagogue, in Corinth, he was teaching them a lesson. And God can save whoever he wants to, whenever he wants to. God's hands are not tied by our incompetence. God saves whom he wants to when he wants to. And God cracks the hardest nuts. And so Crispus was a hard nut, God cracked him. Sosthenes was a hard nut, God cracked him. The beatings that we see going on here, of course, the Apostle Paul was probably surprised when uh, they took Sosthenes and beat him because Paul himself, being a Roman citizen, had been beaten on other occasions. You recall that back in Acts chapter 16. Uh, Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and they've cast us into prison. This was at Philippi, you recall. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. He mentions the fact that he was beaten on a number of occasions over in 2 Corinthians 11.25. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a day and a night I have been in the deep. Paul had been through it. And he lists all the different things. He says, besides that which comes from without, that which is within, you know, the care of all the churches. Paul thought it was more difficult to take care of the churches than to be shipwrecked on multiple occasions. He thought it was harder to take care of churches than to be beaten with rods and stoned and whipped. <laughs> churches are tough places to be. They are. And any pastor will tell you that. But, you know, God used that incident of... Sosthenes getting beaten at the seat of Gallio for good in his life. We need to recognize that even when things that seem to be very adverse to us are happening to us, we have a sovereign God who works all things according to the pleasure of his will, and he is also a God who works all things together for our good, for the good of those who loved him, for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. That's what happened here with Sosthenes, because... That's what God used to draw Sosthenes to Christ. We saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Here it is. Paul's at Corinth, remember? Now he's writing back to the Corinthians. And Sosthenes apparently became a traveling companion with Paul after he got saved. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ. What a privilege. Question for you. Would you be willing to suffer a beating, a humiliating public beating in open court, if it would mean that you would become a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul and be able to hear him preach and be able to be in on his missionary journeys? I think most of us would say yes. We wouldn't like to take the beating, but that lasts a very short time. But to get to travel with the Apostle Paul to get to be mentioned by name in Paul's letter back to our hometown? Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, to the church at Collingswood, and Christian Spencer, our brother. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? I think it would be. Well, Sosthenes went through the grind, but God used him going through the grind to bring him to Christ, to make him into a disciple of the apostle Paul, so he might learn the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he also justified, them he also glorified. 
The name of Sosthenes fits into that list. My name fits into that list. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, your name fits into that list. We saw the connection between Rome and Corinth. We see that at the end of the book of Romans. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Written to the Romans from Corinthus and sent by Phoebe, servant of the church at Sencrea. Sencrea is in our text tonight. Sencrea was one of the two suburbs of Corinth. You remember there on the Isthmus of Corinth where they dragged the ships across the Isthmus to get from one big body of water to another big body of water without having to sail around the entire southern end of Greece. And one of the ports was Sencrea. And Paul is going to leave from Sencrea with those two wonderful tent maker friends of his, Aquila and Priscilla. We're going to see that in our text tonight. Some really exciting things about them, too, as we'll hopefully be learning a little bit later on. Sencrea. There was another woman there at Sencrea who was the servant of the church. She worked as a messenger, carrying messages for the Apostle Paul and carried one to Rome from Corinth. Then it says, Paul continued a long time after that initial 18 months at Corinth, during which time apparently Sosthenes had come to Christ. Verse 18, Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head at Sencrea, for he had a vow. So Corinth ends up being the church with the greatest need, and so that is the church where God chose to let Paul stay for one of the longest periods in his entire ministry. That's incredible. Great need. And God doesn't say, well, you guys are so slow learners. You guys are so bad. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend my time someplace else where I'm going to get a whole lot better results. Aren't we glad that God doesn't work that way? Where there was the greatest need, God poured out the greatest amount of Paul's ministry. Paul. God could have said, you know what, I'm going to keep you in Athens because that's the capital of the world at this time. Or I'm going to keep you in Jerusalem. I'm going to really show those Jews what Christianity is all about. Or I'm going to put you someplace where, where you're going to be reaching millions and millions over your radio broadcasts. <laughs> God didn't do that. God gave his best to the worst. Isn't that a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ? God gave his best to the worst. You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has called the base things of the world and the, the refuse of the world, the things that are nothing, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Paul wrote that to the Corinthians. You see, that church was filled with people that the world would call white trash, that the world would give ugly names to, worthless people. But Christ came to save sinners. It's a marvelous picture that we get as we see Paul here at this church. So let's go back to our text. We'll read the rest of the verses for tonight. We've read verse 18, now in verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. <clears throat> when they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast that cometh in Jerusalem. So in other words, the Apostle Paul still understood the Jewish cycle of feasts, the seven feasts of the Lord, all of which were typological concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them has something to do all the way from his crucifixion all the way through the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. But every one of those feasts has something to do with this promised Messiah. Paul says, there's one feast that I've got to get back to Jerusalem for. You see, it was a very specific feast because Paul had a very specific vow that was going to end at that time. And so the Apostle Paul says, I've got to get back to Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God wills. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. 
And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Now, as we look at this passage tonight, the first obvious thing that I think we learn out of verse 18 is that Paul was definitely not easily intimidated. Remember what just happened? We just read it. He had been dragged into court. He had won his case, but it was he had won his case against the Jews, and the chief ruler of the synagogue gotten beaten. And you know, Paul might have considered, hey, they're going to get revenge on me. I don't think he liked that, and I suspect that the rest of the people who put him up to it don't like that either. And the Apostle Paul thought that perhaps, or he could have thought, that uh, since the church that was meeting, there was meeting right next to the synagogue, that the next time he showed up at the synagogue, there would be these guys in dark glasses and pinstripe suits carrying violin cases waiting for him. <laughs> but it says that Paul tarried there yet a good while. He was not intimidated. Neither should we be. We need to understand that whether we live or whether we die is of the Lord. The Apostle Paul, you remember, we looked at the Apostle Paul as God's bulldog. Remember when he was going to Derby and Lystra and Iconium? Remember when they came running out to offer sacrifices thinking that he was Mercurius and that Barnabas was Jupiter? And they had to stop the people from doing it. And then some people came from Iconium and said, you know what trouble these guys have caused? And so they grabbed him and they stoned him. And then everybody went back to town and thought we got rid of the troublemaker. And while the disciples were standing around, Paul got up. God raised him up out of that stoning. What did he do? Go to the next city? No, it says he walked into town. <laughs> and we talked about how that must have been kind of a surprise for the people who had just been involved in stoning him to death. Paul was not easily intimidated, and if you and I understand the power of the gospel of Christ, we should not be easily intimidated either. We see that here. After this, Paul tarried there yet a good while. You see, the apostle Paul was fully aware of his marching orders. You and I should be too, because our marching orders are from the Lord. His schedule, the content of his schedule, was determined by God not by circumstances. We need to understand that in our own lives. He saw that there was still work to be done in Corinth, in a place that he would have gladly have said goodbye to if he were walking in the flesh. He made the best possible use of his time before he took leave of the brethren, which was on the divine timetable. And then he headed towards Syria, the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. He knew how long it would take to get from Corinth back to Jerusalem to make sure that he made it in time for the feast when his vow would be finished. It's also interesting that he says he took with him Priscilla and Aquila, that married couple that he'd been staying with in Corinth, the people who knew how to make tents, just like he knew how to make tents. At one point, the church was actually meeting in their home in Corinth. And you know, very interesting. I mean, folks, think about your own home for a minute. I mean, the number of people that we have here, I think, could probably fit into any one of our homes. Might be tight and a little bit tight in a couple of them. But can you imagine this group, and sometimes more than this, coming to your house every Sunday morning and every Sunday evening? How many of you ladies would be really excited about that? Come on, let's see some hands. We'll go there next week. <laughs> Yeah, every Sunday. Priscilla put up with that. Every week, making sure the house was all clean, all ready to go. And because they celebrated the Lord's table every week, and it was not merely the teeny tiny little pieces of air that are made out of white paper that we take for the bread and the teeny tiny little juice. You read about the Lord's Supper, they had agape feasts every time they celebrated the Lord's table, every week. That was going on in Priscilla's home every week. They were meeting there in her house, hosting all the believers. First Corinthians 16, 19 tells us that the churches of Asia salute you. 
Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. That was a spiritually minded couple. They were very excited about having the believers gather in their home. What a privilege to use the material resources that God had given to them to be able to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and to meet the needs of other believers. You know, it's rather interesting also because Priscilla, that name, appears to be a term of endearment rather than a given name. Did you ever think of that? Do you know what that name literally means, the name Priscilla? The name Priscilla is a diminutive form from Prisca. It means a little old woman. <laughs> Priscilla, now you don't name babies little old woman. But that's what she was called. That's what her name means. It means a little old woman. It's sort of like saying in English, let me introduce you to my little lady or let me let introduce you to my old lady. <laughs> Down in the south, uh, I've heard that often. Hey, I'd like to introduce you to my old lady. <laughs> yeah. Well, here she was, the little old lady. You know, if she was really old, that probably means that Aquila was old too. That would show that they had some spunk in being willing to make an arduous sea and land journey with the Apostle Paul. They're traveling with Apostle Paul here in Acts chapter 18. And you see all the places that he's going along the way. In any case, there's no mention made of their children ever in the New Testament. So either they were childless or else their children were adults. Hence, they would have already been an older couple. And yet they're traveling with the Apostle Paul here. He takes with him Priscilla and Aquila. I think there's a lesson for us in that. Never use old age as an excuse for trying to get out of service to Christ or using old age as an excuse not to fully and actively participate in a mission venture that opens up to you. Too many of us, I think, think about, oh man, going on a sum team or on some other kind of mission trip, you know, I'm too old for that. Really? Gary Johnson, who is leading the trip, is in his 70s. And he's excited about doing it. Folks, if God opens an opportunity for you to serve him, take advantage of it. Look what incredible blessing Aquila and Priscilla got because they were traveling with the Apostle Paul. I would have loved to have gone on this last sum team. In fact, I was, I was hoping to do it, but the Lord worked some other doors out, and so this year I didn't get to go, but maybe someday I will. And you know what? When that happens, I'll be older. I hope that God, by his grace, enables me to do one of those trips. Never use old age as an excuse for trying to get out of service to Christ. The next thing that we learn in this passage is in training of Apollos, both Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned. The verses for next week tell us about that. It says they were both involved in that. That tells me something else about Priscilla. She was clearly theologically astute. She's a woman who knew her Bible very well. You know, I can identify with that. In Judy, God gave me a wife who was theologically astute. She read Hebrew. She read Greek. In fact, she did her personal Bible study every day out of the original languages. And she and I often had fascinating theological discussions together. Another fascinating thing about her, something she could do that I couldn't do. She also read Spanish and would compare the Hebrew and Greek text with the Spanish text to see where the Spanish translators used words that were not the best translations of the original languages. That's how she kept up with her Spanish, was comparing it with Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> she was an incredible woman. I suspect that Priscilla was like that too. Judy's love for the original languages was one of the most powerful things that attracted me to her when we met. And it continued to be a source of joy to me as long as she was alive. We're going to see more about that next Sunday evening when we get to the future verses, the Lord willing. But let me just show you a few, the next few verses tonight. Starting in verse 24, it says, A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. 
And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, when Aquila and Priscilla heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They. And when he was disposed to pass unto Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. He had only known the scriptures up to that point that pointed to John the Baptist. He'd only known the baptism of John. He stayed with Priscilla and Aquila, and they showed him the rest of the scriptures that pointed to the Christ who had come. And he became a powerful preacher, taking people back to the word of God. That was a cool couple, Aquila and Priscilla. What a blessing it was that I had a wife like that. So the lesson I think that we get out of that is never use the excuse that you're a woman, so therefore you don't really have to study and know the Bible like men have to do it. God holds you, all of you women, personally accountable for learning the scriptures and for being skilled in what he has entrusted to you. You have it in your own language. You have the freedom to study it. You have your own personal copies, which was a very rare thing at the time of the Apostle Paul. So maximize the gifts and potential that God has given to you. Now, we've already seen that Sincrea here that's mentioned was one of the ports of entry across the Isthmus of Corinth. <coughs> the text tells us here that Paul had shaved his head because he had a vow. Now, as you look through the Old Testament, there are many, many different kinds of vows in the Old Testament. And, you know, they, they range from all kinds. Of, for example, uh, a woman who made a vow. If she still lived in the house of her father, the day that her father heard the vow, he could annul the vow. Or if she was a married woman, the day that her husband heard the vow, he could annul the vow. If a man made a vow, it stuck. Nobody could annul it. You know, very interesting to see all the different types of things that related to vows in the Old Testament. But obviously, Paul wasn't dealing with that particular kind of a vow. Paul was a strictly observant Jew prior to accepting Christ as his Messiah. So the vow that he had taken would have been one of the vows listed in the Old Testament, not some kind of a bloodthirsty Japanese assassin's vow. Shaving the head was specifically related in the Old Testament to the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow permitted both men and women, and it related to a person being set apart from others for the service of God. Within the Nazarite vows, there were two different types of Nazarite vows. One of them could be a vow for life, and that actually had two different types within it, or for the rest of the life, for that portion remaining to the person that took it. For example, it could have been for life if your parents made a Nazarite vow concerning you when you were born. Or you could be 30 years old or 50 years old and take a Nazarite vow for the rest of your life if you wish to do so. But then there were also Nazarite vows that could be taken for a set period of time. The usual time for Nazarite vows that are listed in other Jewish writings are 30 days, 60 days, and 90, or 100 days. The second type of vow appears to be what the Apostle Paul had taken upon himself. That particular vow was usually visible by the person not cutting his hair for the duration of the vow. That's what we normally think about when we think of Nazarite vows and when we look at the text here tonight. But there were at least seven other areas that had subparts to them, but at least seven other areas that visibly showed that a person had taken a Nazarite vow. Let me just list them for you quickly. The Nazarite had to abstain from wine, grapes, and every production of the vine. Like he couldn't use grapevines that had been dried out to cook his food with, you know, light the fire with the grapevines. Number two, the Nazarite had to abstain from all other intoxicating drink of any other kind. And as you know, alcoholic beverages are made from different things besides grapes. Number three, the Nazarite was forbidden to approach any dead body, even of his nearest relatives. And if he accidentally touched the dead body, he had to undergo rites of purification, and then he had to start his vow all over again. So suppose you got, you were taking a 90-day vow or a 100-day vow, and you got to day 99, 
and you accidentally bumped into a dead body or you're standing talking to somebody and they fall over dead and hit you and knock you over. You've got to start the thing all over again. Number four, at the end of the vow, the Nazarite was released from the restrictions, but to gain the release, he had to, one, go to Jerusalem. Number two, he had to offer a ewe lamb for a burnt offering. Number three, he had to offer a second ewe lamb for a sin offering. Number four, he had to offer a ram for a peace offering. Plus, he had to offer, if you remember all the stuff we studied about peace offerings, he had to offer all of those other things that accompany the peace offerings, too. He also had to offer a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil. He also had to offer a meal offering and a drink offering. <laughs> Fairly complex to get out of your Nazarite vows. It just sort of hung over your head, no pun intended. Uh, until you went through the entire ritual at the temple in Jerusalem. He had to cut off his hair at the door of the tabernacle where the ta when the tabernacle was in the wilderness. And then he had to take his hair and put it into the fire of the sacrifice on the altar. The priest would then take part of his offerings and present them as a wave offering unto the Lord. Complex business completing off a Nazarite vow. The Nazarite would then have to give a specific gift to the priest, depending on the seriousness of the reason for which the Nazarite had taken the vow. It had to do a few things. I think it gives you an idea as to why it took Paul so long, why he was in the temple day after day after day until when he, finally he gets caught and they go about to kill him and then the centurion runs down and rescues him and all that kind of stuff. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in some future messages. But people say, well, you know, if he, his Nazarite vow was over, why do you have to spend so much time in the temple? This will give you an idea of why he had to spend so much time in the temple. The purpose of the Nazarite vow. It was to show that the Nazarite had renounced the world with its pleasures that are so unfavorable to sanctification and had set, him apart from, set himself apart from all the defiling influences of the world. So in other words, for this, this period of time, this set period of time, whatever it happened to be, the Nazarite was specifically set apart to God for his service and was set apart from the world. I hope that rings some bells for you. Because you see, in the New Testament, the believer is supposed to have this kind of a life perpetually. The stuff in the Old Testament is symbols and types and pictures to describe for us spiritual theological truth. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people and empowered them for limited periods of time and then would depart. But in the New Testament, when you trust Christ, you receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. And as you yield yourself to Christ, he fills you day by day, by day, by day. And it's supposed to be a continual process going on in my life and your life. We are to be living holy lives all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every week of the year, every year of our life, until we step into eternity. And then death breaks all that responsibility because then we are truly purified. Just like when a Nazarite touched the dead body, he had to start all over again. These are pictures and types that God gives to us in the Old Testament so that we can understand something about the life we're to live today. The Apostle Paul explains that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He tells us that they were all sanctified unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The baptism that's going on there is not the Israelites getting wet. No, it was Pharaoh and his army that got wet. But the picture there is we're coming out, we're being separate, we're being set apart from the world. Remember, Egypt is a picture of the world. We talked about that this morning and being set apart to God. They were at the tabernacle. They were under the Shekinah. It was the place that God met with man. It was the picture of Jesus Christ and his blood on Yom Kippur when the blood was, was sprinkled by the high priest on the holiest of all, on the altar, on the Hilasterion, on the mercy seat. The book of Hebrews tells us that's the picture of Jesus. He is our mercy seat. What we see going on here with the Nazarite vow is the same type of thing. For the New Testament believer, it's to be a perpetual lifestyle of holiness from the moment of the new birth 
through physical death, not merely the Old Testament ritual that foreshadowed our position in Christ. That's why the Old Testament Nazarite could not touch a dead body because of the impending symbolism of what it would be true for the life of the New Testament believer. The Old Testament vow showed that a person was holy unto the Lord. For every believer today, we are to be holy unto the Lord. We're told that both in Hebrews and also Peter tells us that in his epistles. The law of the Nazarite, if you want to look at it, is found in Numbers chapter 6. I'll read some of the verses out of this. It runs for 21 verses, a lot of detailed information about what a Nazarite vow entailed. Number six, beginning in verse one, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When either man or woman, you see, this applies to everybody, shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. You couldn't even have raisins. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even unto the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separated himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair grow of his head grow. All the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die because the consecration of God is upon his head. All the days of his separation he is holy unto the Lord. And if any man die suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one as a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering, and make an atonement for him, for he has sinned by the dead, and shall hallow his hair that same day. Getting bumped into by somebody falling over dead, it says he has sinned by the dead. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation and shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost because his separation was defiled. And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He shall offer unto his offering unto the Lord one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering and one ram without blemish for a peace offering and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil and their meat offering and their drink offerings and the priest shall bring them before the Lord and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering and he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also his meat offerings and his drink offerings. And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it in the fire, which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall take the sodden shoulder of the ram and one unleavened cake of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest. And the wave breast and the heave shoulder, and after that the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed, and of his offering unto the Lord for his separation, beside that which his hand shall get, according to the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. Complex rules. He had to follow them. As I mentioned a moment ago, some parents placed the Nazarite vow on their babies even before their babies were born. You know, in that case, the child had no choice in the matter. He was stuck with what his parents had done. I think you all know of Samson, but did you know there are at least three men in Scripture whose parents did this to them? Samson was one. And as a result, it meant that when Samson's hair was cut, he lost his strength. But did you know that Samuel was also a Nazarite? It says so in 1 Samuel 1.11. And so is John the Baptist, Luke 1.15. Being a Nazarite is not the same thing, by the way, as being a Nazarene. People get those two confused. Being a Nazarene means that one came from the town of Nazareth and has nothing to do with taking a vow. Jesus was a Nazarene, not a Nazarite. However, I think at some point in history, well, this is quite obvious, at some point in history, some artists got the two words confused, and so artists started painting Jesus with long hair. 
Did you know that there is no indication anywhere in the Bible that Jesus had long hair? That he ever had long hair? But you start looking at the paintings and you say, oh, Jesus must have had long hair. The one that everybody knows is the Holman painting of Christ with the light glowing in the background and this placid, beautiful face with blonde hair. Of course, Jesus was Jewish. He probably didn't have this golden blonde hair. You know, down below his shoulders. That's a confusion between Nazarene and Nazarite. A Nazarene means he came from Nazareth. Jesus was a Nazarene. He came from Nazareth. That's where he grew up. That's why I can still call myself a Texan. <laughs> I grew up in Texas. <laughs> he was not a Nazarite. No indication in Scripture they had long hair. You know, uh, Paul discusses the issue of long hair on men, and you know the church that he wrote it to? He wrote it to Corinth. Because when Paul got to Corinth, what did they see Paul had? It's at Corinth on his way back that he cuts his hair. Paul was under a Nazarite vow when he got to Corinth. And so what all of his converts saw at Corinth was this Jewish guy that they suddenly respected very much because he had just showed them the way of salvation. So Paul has to straighten some things out. Apparently there were, there were people, there were men there at Corinth uh, who were starting to grow their hair to look like the Apostle Paul. And so Paul dealt with that and dealt with it very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Hence, being a Nazarite for any length of time clearly made a man stand out as strangely different from other men. It was the visible sign of the vow he had taken. But Paul had his head shaved at Sancria, that suburb of Corinth that we talked about a moment ago, rather than waiting to get all the way back to Jerusalem. And there appears to be a very serious reason for this. Apparently, the converts at Corinth were trying to copy Paul as their model in everything, including the way that he had not cut his hair due to the Nazarite vow. But they were Gentiles. They weren't under the Jewish law. They hadn't made vows while they were Jews that they were trying to get out of at some point. They were Gentiles saved out of paganism. They would have not had the foggiest clue concerning the meaning of the significance of the Nazarite vow for a Jew. Sincere imitation, and you know this, is the highest compliment that you can give to someone. And so the men at Corinth were copying Paul. And they were growing long hair. That's clear from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me give you an illustration of how this works. Some of you know of my dad. I don't think any of you ever met him. He was a very wonderful man, powerful man, a leader of men. People followed him and people copied him. I mean, it was just incredible. God gave him gifts that God chose not to give to me. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the gifts God gave me. But God gave him some leadership gifts that made men want to do what he did. I can remember coming home from school one summer, and my dad, sometime during the year, had changed the way he tied his tie. Now, back in those days, all men came to church wearing coats and ties. It was a sign of respect. But my dad had changed the way he tied his tie. Instead of tying one of these knots like you see on my tie here, he had figured out some way of where he tied the tie and it just flipped over the top so you saw no knot at the top. It was simply smooth tie from the very collar line all the way down. He had done it sometime during the way, while, the year while I was away at school. And you know, I came back that summer and every man in the church <laughs> was wearing his tie the way my dad was wearing his tie. Imitation is the highest compliment that you can give to somebody. It shows you respect who they are. And apparently that was what was happening at Corinth. And so Paul did two things. Number one, he didn't wait till he got back to Jerusalem to shave his head. He shaved his head because his vow had come to an end and he shaved it at Corinth so that the entire church could see him with a buzz cut. He didn't just sort of cut his hair and then, you know, 
nice little wave on it. I mean, I cut, I cut my own hair. Do you know that? I cut my own hair. I know you can tell. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't just like this. I mean, he shaved it, it says. It went down to the skin. All the way from what they had seen as this big, bushy thing that looked like some kind of an Afro wig, probably. You know, dark, black, curly, Jewish hair. Boing, boing, boing. All the way down to bald headed he sets the example. He wanted the men at Corinth to understand something. But not just did he cut his hair, because then they could have said, well, you know, uh, you let it grow so long, and then you cut it. He also wrote an extended section of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to explain the theological reasons why the Nazarite vow is not for the church and the biblical reasons that men should have short hair. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now remember we talked about sincere imitation is the highest possible compliment. So it says, follow me like I follow Christ. Jesus was not a Nazarite. Jesus was a Nazarene. And Paul's going to talk about men with short hair. He says, if you want to follow me, Follow me like I'm following Christ now. He's telling them, this is how he starts and introduces the passage, that Jesus didn't have long hair. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. So, okay, you got the ordinances down, you got baptism, the Lord's table, although you're not doing the Lord's table quite right. The end of 1 Corinthians 11 is the passage we read this morning about the abuses of the Lord's table at Corinth. They were a gung-ho people. They tried to do everything, but they did it like really, really, really bad ways. So the first half of the chapter is dealing with short hair on women and long hair on men. End of the chapter is dealing with abuses of the Lord's table. I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances that I delivered them to you. I'm glad you're trying to copy me. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. What is Paul just done here in the book of Acts? He says, look, you can see what it looks like to see a bald-headed guy? You women who are praying and prophesying with your head uncovered. Hey, you know, that's the same thing as you looking like me look right now. Bald-headed. How many of you like to see bald-headed women? No. Even those whose hair has fallen out because of chemotherapy treatments wear wigs. Because it's a shame for a woman to have a bald head. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. That's what Paul just had done in Acts. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power, that's exousia, that's the word for authority, on her head because of the angels. That is not cultural. Too many people take 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and try to make it into a cultural argument and say, well, that was just back in th those days because, you know, after all, it was the prostitutes who ran around without head coverings uh, and it was the prostitutes who cut their hair short. Look, angels don't have to worry about prostitutes. The first reason he gives here is the angels are watching. He's going to give another non-cultural illustration in a second. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things are of God. Judging yourselves, is it comely, that is it fitting and beautiful, that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now, Paul had had long hair. When he got to Corinth, he had long hair because he had a Nazarite vow. It was something that showed he was different, but it was not the way 
that God intended for men to be, only if they had a Nazarite vow, which was not the case for the Gentiles at Corinth. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Dear Judy grew her hair for me. After we got married, she never cut her hair. In the entire almost 41 years of marriage that God gave to us. And when she would let it down at night, it came down below her waist. Beautiful long hair. She did it not only for my pleasure, because I enjoyed that very much, but she did it because of what 1 Corinthians 11 says. The glory of a woman's hair reflects the glory of Christ. If a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Verse 16 is a verse that most folks like to jump on. If any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. And they say, ah, they had no custom of the men having short hair and the women having long hair, of the men not covering their heads and of the women covering their heads. No, your immediate context tells you what he's talking about is contentiousness. We're not accustomed to arguing about this subject, says the Apostle Paul. If any man seemed to be contentious, we have no such custom. We have no custom of arguing about this issue. This is because of two reasons. Number one, the angels are watching the church. And number two, the natural order that God has created. Neither one of those things are cultural. Oh, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. Maybe someday I will as I go through 1 Corinthians. But you know, the church today has forgotten that. The church today has forgotten that. I don't think any of you ever saw Judy come to church without a head covering of some sort. Because she wanted to prove and demonstrate not only to the church, but to the angels who were watching, that she was under the authority of her husband. You see, it's a symbol of authority. Remember, I talked about the word exousia, power. That's the word for authority and being under authority. And the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And the woman is under the authority of the man. Well, it's fun when I meddle, isn't it? Okay, it's rather interesting that this disorder in the church, bossy women with short hair take, uh, talking in the church, which is another of the problems there, they were busy talking in the church, and wimpy men with long hair letting the women take the lead. Immediately precedes Paul's exhortation concerning the Lord's table, which we read this morning. Having long hair also could be a sign of rebellion in men. We see an illustration of that in Absalom in 2 Samuel 14, 25 and 26. He only got himself a haircut once a year and they weighed his hair and it weighed several pounds at the end of the year. And he was a rebel. He wasn't a Nazarite. He was a rebel. He's the one who rebelled against King David. He's the one who tried to kill his own father. He's the one who slept with David's concubines on the roof of the palace in the sight of all Israel. He was a rebel. Long hair didn't mean that he was holy. It showed that he was in rebellion against authority over him. That's a point that Paul's making also there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul wanted to make sure that the men at Corinth were not sending mixed signals as they tried to witness to their pagan neighbors. Most long hair on men that started with the hippie movement in the 1960s fits into that category of rebellion, a sign of defiance against authority and the spirit of rebellion. Now, as we look at the rest of the passage, and I see our time is running out, Paul was eager to get back to Jerusalem so that he could complete the requirement of his vow. If you remember, all those steps that we read a moment ago were necessary to complete the vow that we just listed so you can understand why it took so long for him to do the latter. He came to Ephesus, left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And we'll, by the way, see him keeping that promise. He said, I'm going to come, come again, you know, like MacArthur said to the Japanese, and I'll come back. 
uh, we will see him keeping that promise in Acts chapter 20, when we get to Acts chapter 20. And when he landed at Caesarea and had gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. You know, even on his way back to Jerusalem to fulfill his vow, the Apostle Paul made the very best possible use of his time, of his ministry time, so that he might strengthen the church every place he'd been. Well, our time is up for tonight. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you for the marvelous, wonderful things that you do in each of our lives day by day to conform us to the image of Christ. We thank you, Father, for Paul's example and for Paul's teaching. We thank you that as he has given us both an example and teaching, that it is designed to be practical and applicable for us today. We're talking New Testament here. We're not talking Old Testament Nazarite vows any longer. We're talking about what's right for the church, in the church, that we might be a testimony to the people in the world around us, the pagans who are watching us, the things that we do, not merely the things that we say. So, Father, we pray that you will help us, by the grace of God, to set the kind of example that's necessary so that we will not cause a stumbling block to anyone else whom you might graciously lead to Christ through the witness that you've given to us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 400.